Hey everyone, I should be live. Let me know uh, when I'm actually live. Somebody to tell me. There we go. <clears throat> so uh, the guest hasn't shown up yet, uh, but I it doesn't surprise me uh, because there was literally a SpaceX launch just, um, you know, within the last hour. So. Um, He's a little busy, so um, so you can just get me right now. But I'll uh, I'll talk to Andrew and see if we can schedule another time uh, that we actually have him here on the show. So we'll just answer your questions. Um, but when he does come back, we're going to be talking about this Beyond the Known, his new book, which I read, um, and it was awesome. I really enjoyed it. So uh, we, hopefully we'll get into that in a couple of uh, a couple of weeks as soon as as soon as we recoordinate but i'm going to leave the window open and if andrew shows up then uh then we'll talk but if not then it's just going to be uh you and me so uh let's uh let's get into let's try to think of any updates so we've got a new episode of the show of the guide to space which is on the server it's going to go out to patrons in a couple of minutes and then it's going to go out to everybody tomorrow and it's all about the future of exoplanets essentially applying moore's law to planet hunting and you get the prediction that you'll have about a hundred million planets by the year 2050 if you just follow the math and so then the question is how um so that's the plan. Uh, other updates. I think we're going to still do um, the next uh, open space next week. Probably no guest. I've got a couple of people that I'm trying to coordinate with. Um, and then we've got another one. Uh, we'll do the next one like right after Christmas. So, uh, so I'll put those in the schedule and we'll do that. And then I think that'll be the last one because then on January 2nd, Chad and I are going to fly to Honolulu for a romantic astronomy convention um so the plan is we're going to go to the american astronomical society union which is their annual meeting which is going to be in honolulu we're going to fly in we're going to be there for a week and we're going to attend a bunch of talks we're going to interview as many people as we can get our hands on and then bring all that stuff back and then just turn it into shows for you so so stay tuned um, so then during that week and, and Pamela Gay from astronomy cast is going to be there. So we'll probably do some, um, some live shows, probably trying to do like a live weekly space hangout. A ton of the people who we do these various shows with will all be together. So, um, and I'll try to let you know who's going to be there as we get closer and then maybe we can do an open space with some people there. So, uh, anticipate a bunch of cool events while we're there and, Oh, my dog just showed up. Um, and uh, like I said, Chad's going to be there with me, so I won't be trying to coordinate everything all on my own. Chad will be there to actually uh, shoot video and help keep things organized. So it should be good. All right. So then until uh, if if the guest shows up, um, then we'll switch to that. But if not, um, as always, go ahead and hit me with your questions, whatever you've got. Um so Neil, you asks, does SpaceX have any future missions to try Starship with Vasimir or X3 engines? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I am not aware that uh, SpaceX is planning on uh, incorporating either a Vasimir or an X3 engine. Now, with the you know, the, SpaceX does have a lot of experience now with ion engines, arguably more experience with ion engines than anyone ever, because the Starlinks all have an ion engine on board. And so they've been able to actually test out and they're using a Krypton ion engine as opposed to the normal Xenon ion engine. And so they're going to build a ton of experience. I wouldn't be surprised if they've been watching this very carefully. The great thing about ion engines is they're very, very fuel efficient. So you can just, uh, you can use sunlight to create electricity, to take ions and blast them out the back of your spacecraft. You don't have to carry a lot of fuel to be able to thrust for a long period of time. So, um, looking forward to that. Um, Geek in, uh, oh, uh, Volvacat17 asks, have I seen The Expanse season four? Have I ever? Yeah, uh, it's so good. This season of The Expanse is the best. Uh, it's my favorite of the bunch so far. And Carla and I are up to episode seven now. 
we've been really it's been, it's been just like going down so easy uh it's really hard now to just keep binging them all and we're trying to pace ourselves and it's funny i was talking with my dad and as soon as they they came back as well he was like oh you watching the expanse I'm like yeah and so both of us are trying to pace ourselves to try and watch the to watch the show um but if you haven't watched the expanse definitely get on that i'm so glad that it got picked up on amazon prime and not get got canceled and in fact there's a bunch of other um cool sci-fi that's been picked up by Amazon Prime. They're going to be doing the Foundation series, and apparently they're also going to be doing uh, Ian M. Banks' Culture series and other fairly cool hard sci-fi. So I'm I'm kind of looking forward to what the future holds. Having Jeff Bezos, who's like such a space nerd, uh, running Amazon and being able to influence some of the shows that they get uh, chosen, I'm really looking forward to that. Um. Beth Johnson, hey Beth, uh, says, what has been your favorite space news story for 2019? Uh, it's got to be the, uh, the imaging of the supermassive black hole at M87. Um, in fact, we're doing a mission sticker for 2019 and sort of like as a souvenir for people who, who watch the show. Um, and, and that's what we've chosen is the, is the supermassive black hole picture because it's just the first time we've seen a photograph. I mean, it's not really a photograph. An image of the event horizon of a black hole is incredible. And hopefully this is just the first of many supermassive black hole photographs that we get. So that for, for this year, like normally it's pretty tough to figure out like what is the, the best one. But this year, I think there's no contest to get a supermassive black hole photograph for the first time is just a stunning accomplishment. And when you think about how hard it was for them to pull together this network of telescopes around the whole entire world and then combine all the material, you know, telescopes in Antarctica and telescopes in Greenland and telescopes around the world and then to take all that data and put it into one place and process it all down to one image, just absolutely stunning. And I cannot wait for the picture of the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. And maybe that'll turn out to be the main story for next year as well. So stay tuned. Um, Astro YYZ, any word of SpaceX engineers have addressed Starlink concerns from astronomers? I've heard rumors. So, so the, when Starlink launched, of course, the big concern is that it's a giant streak of light that passes right through the field of view. And the original concern is that they would be really bright to the unaided eye. And it looks like that's not the problem. Like when they first launch, you can see them. But then when they have been going for a while, you don't, you know, you won't be able to see them unless you're in like incredibly dark skies. And even that, maybe not. So apparently the next round, they're going to be painting them black. And that should decrease the albedo by the by a couple of it should decrease it by I think three magnitudes is what I've heard. So it's going to take them from just below the limit of visual magnitude down to uh, comfortably that you won't see them in you know you won't see them with your own eyes. You will still see them in big telescopes, and there's going to be a lot of them. So I think. There is no really addressing the concerns of of the astronomers who are doing like some of the big observatories like the um, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope is going to be seeing the whole sky and it's going to have Starlinks going through every single picture that it takes probably. And so we're and there's kind of no way around that. And so it's just going to degrade the quality of the images from astronomy. And as I always mention, right, the question is, like, like I think we have to assume that people want Internet, that, that there are 3.5 billion people in the world today who have Internet, and there's going to be another 3.5 billion who want Internet tomorrow. And the Internet is, is now, like, it is joining the modern society, right? If you want to be able to do banking, if you want to be able to do commerce, like to not have access to the internet is now to be a second class citizen in the world. And there is this digital divide between the haves and the have nots. And having internet makes you part of the haves and not having internet is going to make you part of the have nots as people are able to transfer money and collect wealth and do all this, right? And so if you know that, that people are going to be able to want the internet, 
then the question is, what is the way that you're going to do it? Is it going to be millions and millions of cell phone towers? Is it going to be um, undersea cables? Is it going to be digging channels? Is it going to, like, what's it going to be? Internet satellite seems like the most reasonable way to go about it, but it all depends on whether or not the internet gets used to provide internet to people who don't have it. If not, then, then it's an insult. And if it is, then it's worth, then it's, you know, it's, it's an acceptable cost for being able to help the other half of planet earth get access to the internet. So that's how I feel. I'm, I'm still waiting for it to actually be operational. And, and I even made Elon Musk on Twitter, on, on Twitter, sort of confirm that, that they're going to make this available to the world and, you know, help the underserved get access to the internet. And so if not, then I will, I'll be the first to nag him and call him out. But if he, but if they do, then, then this is, this is the price we're going to pay for everybody to be on the internet. Um, oh, there we go. Let's see. Now I have to put on some headphones. So Andrew just showed up, but I don't know if you can hear me. Here, you're gonna love this. So, so people don't realize this. So when I do uh, these these hangouts, um, there, I have a sign because people don't know to join the computer audio. So you're all gonna see this as well. So check this out. So let's see if he gets this. Can you hear me, Andrew? All right. Hopefully he saw that. Um, yeah, I get enough of the <laughs> enough people when they join. Um, they like when you join the meeting, it instantly has you like confirm one little box, and if you don't notice, then it closes away, and then people have no idea how to be able to connect. To the uh, to the hangout, so hopefully uh, he'll be able to do that. All right, let's get on with the question. Um, uh, Greg Ewing asks, "How do you write about? How do you go about writing scripts for YouTube?" Uh, it's it's an article. Oh, I can hear you now, Andrew. Hey, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I'm late. No problem. No problem. Uh, can you turn your? Uh, actually, this might work. Let me just see here. Hold on. Everybody, see? yeah, that's fine. That works. Yeah, you guys were busy. You had a uh, you had a rocket launch. Yes, we did. Um, so uh, welcome to uh, to Open Space. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. And thanks for the book. Yeah. So so who are you? What do you do? Uh, I'm a mission manager at SpaceX. I am an aerospace engineer. I also am really interested in history, which is why I wrote a book that is about two thirds history yeah. and one third science, uh, sort of a science history crossover book, kind of like Guns, Germs, and Steel sort of type of book, nonfiction. Uh, I am originally from Canada, yeah, uh, like like you are as well. I think uh, I don't know if you're from Canada really originally, but I yeah, guess yeah. you live in Columbia. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm on the West Coast. I'm on Vancouver Island. Yep. Cool. I love that place. My grandmother's from Victoria, so yeah, or, yeah. Or used to live yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're about so. three hours north of Victoria. So, and you're 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 East Coast or like Toronto area? Where are you from? No, no, no. Oh, oh yeah, I'm from Ottawa originally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good. Canada represent. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so what do you do at SpaceX today? Uh, so I manage a couple of NASA missions. Um, one is start it's to crash into an asteroid, see if we can divert the asteroid. Yeah. And one is uh, XP, which is a space telescope mission, uh, X-ray space telescope looks at uh, galaxies and distant galaxies and dark matter and things like that. You probably actually know more than I do what the <laughs> telescope itself is doing. <laughs> you know about the rocket and I, I, I know, know about, about the rocket. I know exactly. about the missions. That's true. I do know quite a bit about right. the dark mission, but, uh, I, but less about that, less about the, the x-ray mission. Uh, you know, they're less, you know, I'm less intrigued by, you know, things to go and try and smash up asteroids. That's pretty cool. I'm, I'm all, yeah. uh, I'm all on board. Um, totally. but, uh, and so, so let's talk about the book. Um, I really enjoyed it. And, uh, it's funny because I was like, I was like, okay, with your background, I was like looking forward to sort of this, 
you know, the, the future of space exploration. And you definitely get into that, but that was by far the least interesting part about the whole book to me. And maybe it's because I'm, you know, I'm sort of in it so much that I'm really familiar with it. But all the history, like there was like almost one shocking surprise to me on almost every page. It was like elephant birds mm, on yeah. Madagascar or something like that. Like three times the weight of ostriches. Yeah. Eggs, like, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Like, yeah. But in fairly recent history, yeah. like we ate them. Only like 500 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We ate them basically to extinction yeah yeah and yeah just imagine like i always wanted to go to seattle they have these uh markets where you can buy ostrich eggs and just kind of like nonchalantly have people over for brunch and crack like hey you want an omelet and just like <laughs> crack, yeah. crack an egg and it's like 60 eggs or whatever uh but these are a lot bigger than even ostrich eggs yeah it's it's like three times the size of a of that that's yeah, Matt, so I, I totally got carried away with, um, I mean, I've always been really interested in history, but you're absolutely right. I found the history stuff actually much more fun to write about because I guess I do space stuff all the time. I think a lot of people will definitely uh, get it for the space component. And, there, and I think that, you know, my wife, like, for example, she liked the space part the best, sort of future looking. Uh, but to me, I found actually the history stuff the most fascinating. And Madagascar in particular is is really interesting because it's right next to Africa where humans evolved, but humans didn't reach it until around 1500 years ago for the first time. And they didn't come from Africa. They came from across the Indian ocean, basically the Polynesians, the Austronesians, people from Indonesia came across and it's the people who started the spice trade. Yeah. And I always like, I knew kind of about the European spice trade, but I was kind of wondering like, well, how did they know there were spices there in the beginning and who, who brought the spices and this kind of stuff, right? Like. We're just like left with the story of exploration being like Europeans went out to get spices. Well, what, how did they even know they yeah. were there? Yeah. And, and <laughs> right. that was the part that I found so fascinating was just how when the Europeans started to connect with the rest of the world, how like well organized the entire East was in trading. They were already very busy trading trade routes all over the place. And, you know, the Europeans kind of connected into this one node and we're able to start bringing some of the the resources back to the back to the west but you know i think a lot of our history books are this very eurocentric look at the mm -hmm. way the exploration happened but in fact you know a lot of exploration was is it's a human thing totally and it's kind of the opposite that we think of and in fact the center of the world has always basically been india because india sits at the crossroads between china and europe and the Romans and the Greeks, they knew about the Indian Ocean. They had a travel guide in the Indian Ocean over 2,000 years ago. Alexander the Great, when he reached India, sent one of his general or one of his admirals, Nearchus, down the Indian coast and through the Persian Gulf. And the Greeks had charted the Indian Ocean, which is fascinating because when the Portuguese arrived, they didn't know any of this stuff, and Europe had forgotten it. But but Europeans had actually gone to the European uh, to, to the Indian Ocean. Like 2000 years ago, the Romans every year had a trading fleet that went to India yeah. where they gathered spices. And so all of this age of exploration was just a rediscovery of what Europe had known 2000 years before, uh, which I find absolutely fascinating. And the reason why Europe set out on this age of exploration was because it was excluded from the center of the world. The center of the world is not the Mediterranean as its name implies. Mediterranean literally means center of Earth. <laughs> Right. Um, but it's actually the Indian Ocean and it's always been the Indian Ocean for yeah. thousands of years. And uh, it was because Europe was at the, the far edges of kind of in this obscure place far away from the center of the world that there was this massive incentive for them to try to break into the world market and get uh, spices from uh, the Southeast Asia, silks from China. Uh, other goods from India, and, and it's really because they were excluded by it. It specifically was triggered by like the, the conquest of Constantinople in mm -hmm. 1453. The Turks uh, cut some of the old trade routes uh, that the Greeks had orig originally established along the Silk Road. And uh, how did uh, how did you go about like going for your sources? Because like I said, again, uh, you know, in reading it, there was. There was a lot of stories that I knew the broad brushstrokes, but there was a lot of specifics that, again, I was very unfamiliar with a lot of the specific instances. So how did you go about uh, digging up your, your material? 
So I've read a lot of books and I started with this kind of idea uh, that was formulated in my mind. And then I guess I just read a lot of books related to it, anything remotely connected. And then I would sort of follow tangents. And when I write, I have kind of these tangents in my mind, they'll pop up and I found it hard not to digress on little facts. Yeah. Some of them I found really fascinating. And so I would just go and research a specific topic when, when it popped up. And, and some things were actually kind of almost open sourced. Like when I was, I was talking about the connection of India and Europe, and I sent out a tweet about the Roman days of the week. Our, our days of the week are all named after Roman gods, yeah. but basically planets, like the sun and the moon and celestial bodies, all the old um, Mars is Tuesday, for example. And, um, Jupiter is Wednesday, which is more obvious in the uh, Votan is the like head God. Who's, yeah. You know, Jupiter in our language, it, it's from Votan. Um, and I sent this out about just the days of the weeks being named after the gods and the planets. And this guy in India said, Hey, you know that in India, we also use the exact same <laughs> planets for the same days right. of the week, which right. is, it's like fascinating. Yeah, it can't be a coincidence. Yeah, that cannot exactly. Yeah. I mean, it would be like seven factorial plus yeah. the whole idea of naming them after them at all, right? Yeah. So, yeah, totally. Um, so this is another hint at just the interconnectedness of the world. And I think that uh, the world has really experienced three great waves of human expansion. The first being when we left Africa and settled every speck of land except for a few islands far out at sea in Antarctica. But, you know, when European explorers went around, they found humans everywhere, of course, already there. Um, and then there was this ancient world connection where the Romans went to China, the Romans went to India, the Chinese went to India, the Indians went to Egypt. I mean, all, the old world was connected for over 2000 years. Uh, but then it was kind of forgotten, basically, for, for during the Dark Ages for a thousand years. And then it was just revived during the Euro European Age of Exploration, which was the third and final wave that connected the world into the system we have today. Yeah. And, you know, by 1400, Europeans knew basically nothing about the world. And by uh, 1550, they reached Japan and knew all the old world. And obviously, by then, had sailed to the Americas and the Spanish sailed across the Pacific to the Philippines and where, where they met all kinds of Asians from not only the Philippines, but China and Indonesia and India. And this is how the world was connected, and this is the world we have today. The, you know, the big advantage that that they really had with the original exploration is you could live off the land. The, wherever you went, you're breathing the air, you're drinking water, yes. you're you're pulling fish out of the ocean. You know, the planet is supporting your your exploration and your travels. It's going to be remarkably different when we attempt to make similar journeys out into the into the solar system. How do you think that the history of exploration, just the lessons learned, how does that inform the people who are thinking about the future of this? I, throughout history, surprisingly, uh, European explorers didn't try to do that very much. <laughs> and and it's it's definitely a failing though, because like, for example, you look at the Franklin expedition to the Arctic and they tried to bring canned food. They tried to bring everything with them, basically. I mean, obviously the air, <laughs> they breathe the air, but, uh, and the water probably, but they tried to bring all their food. Yeah. And they tried to bring the marvels of modern technology. And this was a horrible disaster because the Inuit who were around them were living perfectly fine, but they all died. Yeah. <laughs> despite being equipped with modern technology. So, um, yeah, so I think that's one of the lessons is that we need to li learn to live off the land, at least in the sense of being able to produce our bulk consumables. I think that's obviously the most important first step, and that's why we pick destinations which have lots of water, uh, yeah. frozen water, um, a usable atmosphere, carbon dioxide on Mars is very useful. I think that's another reason why it makes sense to go to Mars. Uh, rather than the moon. Yeah. So uh, living off the land is very important. And they even just kind of doing things that are rational. I mean, Cook was the first explorer who didn't lose a large number of people to scurvy. And what he did was he brought carrots and, and soup preserve and sauerkraut. Yeah. Right. Big giant vats of sauerkraut, just like the Vikings. So yeah. lots yeah, of vitamin you know, C there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we'll take sauerkraut to Mars. 
make sure. <laughs> yeah, I guess, or whatever the equivalent is. I guess we yeah. probably have vitamin pills that probably work these days. But, yeah, 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 or high, grow things in hydroponics. But, but it's funny. Like we did a, I did a video just about all the sort of lines of evidence for the different. Uh, resources that we know that are on Mars, you know, how we know that there is nitrogen, how mm. we know that there's, uh, you know, various gases and so on. And, th and that nitrogen is a good example, there's that there are things which are plentiful here on Earth, but actually are fairly rare and hard to get at on Mars that are, they're going to be key. So it's almost like the things that we think yeah. are really easy to get at, like we breathe air, other things, you know, getting and we pull nitrogen out of the air for fertilizer and stuff. That's mm -hmm. actually going to be really tricky to get in yep. large quantities from Mars. So, what do you think are going to be some of the stuff that maybe people will be surprised how difficult an engineering challenge they're going to be? Oh yeah, I, th I mean, obviously, anyone we have on Mars for the next fifty to hundred years is probably going to be in some way dependent on Earth. Uh, bulk consumables will try to produce like water and air, but even food, I think people talk about growing food on Mars and yeah, that's, that's a worthy goal, but you know, we're going to have to import food for quite a long time. I mean, Hawaii imports most of its food, yeah. <laughs> most, yeah. many places on yeah. earth import yeah. so, most of their food. So, so Japan, does my island. Right? Yeah. Right, right. Exactly. So, so I think, you know, bulk imports of, of like dried food and things like that are just the reality. So that's one of the things. The other thing is um, advanced technology. Yeah, we can talk about like 3D printing and stuff. And I think that will be definitely a good thing to do. But it is going to Mars is like, I think, huge logistical challenge because you have to plan everything in advance. But you're going to have to bring like computers. Imagine trying to yeah. make a computer on Mars. Like, yeah. I mean, it's just... Yeah, a chip we have fab. factories in Taiwan probably that make you know all our chips and, and yeah. that is just not going to happen in the near term. But uh, hopefully, local small scale production is something that is improving a lot with three D printing. So yeah. hopefully, it will come along. But it's we're not there yet. It's interesting to me that, uh, and I don't know sort of who has the who has the plans for this, but like all of these logistics. I mean, I know, I know NASA has done a lot of work of this, but but I think you know there's all the work that's being done by say the Mars Society with their their mm -hmm. research station in the desert. But and and then of course what happened with Biosphere Two, where they put out you know they put people into a closed closed environment, it feels like still that closed cycle environment hasn't been figured out to the level of detail that it's going to be required for living off the planet. For long term, absolutely right. Um, it, it, it's definitely not a closed cycle being able to um, recycle everything. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're gonna have to have inputs of water and, and air uh, or in, and carbon dioxide in that case, for sure. Um, you're recycling everything is not realistic. Yeah, yet. yeah. But even just, you know, whatever you're short of, you just bring it all from hopefully the starships will keep landing with more, you know, food that they're offloading. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I say it's like it's basically a big logistical challenge. You have to plan in advance and have spares of everything, and yeah, and pre—I mean, pre-in-place supplies. I think is one of the keys, right? You you'd have to have things in place before you actually send people. I think that's definitely what you would do. Yeah. Um, so, what do you, uh, you know, as you sort of look to where the future the future goes? Where do you sort of, um, what are some like big milestones, some big things that you think still need to be overcome for us to kind of unlock whatever comes next. You know, there was like some really big, amazing technologies that they figured out, like just timekeeping back with the, you know, the, the longitude prize and things like that, being able to finally mm. figure out how to be able to navigate out on the open yeah. ocean and not get lost. So what are some of those big technologies that you think you see coming forward? Well, the biggest thing is just being able to send large amounts of things into space. So reducing the cost of, of access to space, because right now it's just really expensive to send anything. So imagine planning the logistics for a mission that's two, three years long. I mean, you'd have to launch double and triple of everything. And you're probably going to want launch a lot more than that because you want to have backups and you're not quite sure what will be needed. And so it's just this massive planning. It's like International Space Station on steroids in terms of the logistical planning. So I think that the most important space technology, hands down by far, is just improving access to space, meaning right. raw making, launch capability. Yeah. If we could send 
ships across space like we send ships across oceans, it would be pretty easy. I mean, we just pile the goods on a super tanker <laughs> uh, and, and send it across, right? And it's not even a matter of like propulsion. Like it's not even that we need improved propulsion technologies to cut the time down. The time matters a little bit, but really with good planning, you should be able to account for that. Um, you know, the, the launch windows to Mars, um, you should be able to follow the same kind of trajectory, trajectories, not have to speed up the time a lot. It's, it's, I think the main technology really is just the improved access to space. So you want a fully reusable vehicle that you're going to be able to launch regularly with large amounts of payload. That's, that's really the breakthrough technology that you need. Yeah. I I mean, you know, with the original presentation from Starship, you know, Musk said that the, that the Starship will be able to, you know, just one of these things will essentially out launch every other rocket ever built in the history of humanity. And that'll just Mm -hmm. be one of them, right? If there is launching three times a day, eight times a day with the, with the super heavies, I mean, that's a, that's putting a lot of material out into space. Um, Yeah. You know, one of the, the, the themes that I always have on, on my channel is just this idea that it actually feels to me like we are in this sort of in this time when it was important to launch a lot of material from Earth out into space. But hopefully we'll transition out of that again within a, however many hundred years as we start to acquire more of the resources of space in space. And then it'll just be the, you know, the people who want to go to space, but everything else will be gathered from, from space itself. So it's almost oh, totally. Like, yeah. Yeah. The reason why we consider space to be difficult is be and expensive is because we live at the bottom of a giant gravity well, right? Yeah. Once you have materials and the ability to produce materials in space, uh, it will be a matter of developing inter, uh, interplanetary commerce, which is a lot easier than just even launching things from space, uh, for, from Earth itself. Yeah, absolutely. That's And the long term is people often ask, you know, why should people go to space? And I think in the long run, we won't even be asking that question because it's going to be people who are already in space right. <laughs> driving that, right? The, it, it's kind of like a reaction, a chemical reaction with an activation energy. And once you have get over that hump, uh, sort of feeds itself, I think. Yeah, yeah. Why, why go to space? Because that's where my family is and I'm going to visit them <laughs> for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Exactly. Right. Yeah. That's why to go to space. Um, yeah. But it, but it's funny because it does feel like like right now it's this race to build all these different rocket launchers. But it really is this. It's a transition. And then we'll get because there's no real yep. value to bring stuff off of Earth into space. And there's not even a lot of value to bring things from space back down to Earth. It's to find that stuff in space and use it in space. To for whatever for whatever comes next. Yeah, I think there's a parallel here with North America, for example, to Europe. What use was North America to Europe? Uh, other than the fact, I mean, so the Spanish obviously plundered lots of gold yeah. and silver, which actually turned up really badly for them because it drove inflationary crisis that wrecked their economy. In, you could argue that Spain probably didn't benefit from its new world's yeah. presence at all. I think it really didn't, actually. It uh, wrecked its geopolitical situation in the long run, within a couple hundred years. Um, so obviously there were imports like tobacco and cotton and things like that, uh, that did, you know, fuel the British economy. But like in the civil war, the Confederacy banned, uh, blocked all the exports of cotton uh, to try to starve the British economy. And they ended up just finding new sources in Egypt and India. So, I mean, what was the benefit? I think the benefit was in terms of technology, in terms of incentives. Uh, I think that's always been the main benefit mm-hmm. of exploration. It's that it, by definition, exploration places us on the leading edge of what's possible, and that expands our horizons, and it leads to all kinds of breakthroughs that you didn't expect to find. And that really is the argument for exploration, and that is why throughout history, exploration has been a huge benefit to humans. It's been, I think, one of the, along with possibly military conflict, it's been maybe the greatest incentive driver for progress right. in history. Yeah, people always ask me, and, like, why why send humans yeah. to space? Like, you know, why not just send robots? And my answer is like, well, how will you know how to send humans to space if you don't try to figure out how to send humans to space? Like, it's, it's that is the goal in itself, is to explore. It is, absolutely. Yeah, right. it is. And it uh, creates all kinds of positive uh, benefits, uh, just acting as one of the greatest technological incentive drivers there, there is. 
Yeah, yeah. And so that's, it, that's the role that exploration has always had. I mean, I think it's no accident that the scientific revolution happened at the same time as the ex age of exploration. These are people testing hypotheses about the geography of Earth, uh, learning about what's possible. So in terms of forms of government, economics, all these things, uh, Europeans went out and exposed themselves to ideas from the world. Uh, obviously, there's lots of negative impacts in the history of exploration as well. But uh, in terms of the growth to Europe, it was just a huge technological uh, incentive driver. Have you been watching The Expanse? Have you caught, have you caught up with season four yet? Uh, is season four out now? Yeah, so just, I've it just, just been... dropped like three days oh, ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, really? No, I have seen all of season three. So, yeah, I've, uh, yeah I'm looking Be forward to watching that. It's the best seen. season. Good show. Um, okay. Yeah, and 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 you know, I don't want to. I'm not going to spoil it. But the themes they go they go in this is is a, sort of, it's about scarcity, is really mm. the theme, the overlying theme again and again mm. is that there's sort of scarcity, like it's a I guess it's like a highly automated society on Earth, and so there aren't a lot of jobs, and so there's a lot, but but wealth isn't distributed very equally, and so there's you know it sort of foments revolution and then the same situation on mars that that there just aren't a lot of jobs and people are starting to turn to crime and then there's sort of like a new place that people are exploring through the rings and the same thing is not enough to go around and it's sort of turning people it's sort of at a larger scale just between the belters and the people on mars and people on earth mm -hmm. but also just at a tiny little scale just in you know on this world how uh, difficult it is for people to get along when the amount of resources starts to run out. And I think that's part of it as well, is that this need to explore is to is a, is a sort of a, it's a pressure valve for humanity mm -hmm. a lot of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because after a while, you realize you are just in a closed ecosystem. And, you know, here on Earth, we're, we're pumping out carbon dioxide and we're in, you know we're we're wiping out species and we're just you know mm -hmm. it's a it's a closed environment and i think it feels like emotionally that's one of the things that is quite um is driving a lot of for people is they're quite excited about this possibility to kind of release that pressure valve of what's going on here on planet earth yeah i think it is even just in terms of our energies and our drive, right? It's it's something for us to do that is a grand adventure that is not military conflict. It's something yeah. that has a positive. It's I think it's sort of a parallel of of, of military conflict. It's like it's constructive instead of fighting amongst each other. We can do something together, yeah. and it harnesses a lot of the same energies, right? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That that when military gives us technology and often increases the economy because people, you know, don't want to get invaded and they're trying to do everything they can to pull together. Mm -hmm. And yet the outcome is horrible loss of life and damage to, you know, in the end, it's an absolutely an, a net loss. And, and exploration and discovery, and even scientific exploration mm -hmm. is that same instinct, but applied for something that is largely constructive. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. And I think that's, it's almost like it's the, um, if you want that, if you want the same payoff emotionally without having to feel the downsides of, you know, having to fight other people, they're, mm -hmm. they're clearly really close together. That's a really interesting insight. I haven't really sort of thought about it that way. That's, that's great. I like that a lot. I'm going to, I'm going to steal that <laughs> <laughs> as, well, you know, cause people, like, I think that's something that does kind of emotionally resonate with me, just how how those two are so closely yeah. linked. I mean, I, I um, so I'm a huge, huge history buff, particularly military history. And when I was young, I was sort of honestly disappointed that like World War II was like generations ago because, oh, now I can't like be part of something, right? Yeah. <laughs> be part of like this big enterprise, which is kind of a weird way to think about it. But I mean... I think that they thought they were contributing to something more important than themselves, right? Um, which, which they did. Uh, but, you know, exploration for me, is, I see as sort of an alternative to that that is a net positive for everyone. Rather, yeah, exactly, as you say. It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the way to get those instincts out in a way that mm -hmm. causes less, causes less harm and, and grief. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's interesting. So what do you think is like a, um, 
like a misunderstanding that people might have about which things about say going to Mars are actually going to be easier than we think and which ones are going to be a lot harder than we think. I think we, so with the harder, I think we covered that a little bit, just, you know, the things that are be, going to be difficult to produce or to get. Uh, I think that's, you know, the logistical challenge is, I think, easy to, uh, easy to overlook a little bit. Um, so I think that that's one of the main challenges we face. I mean, I can see, yeah, when the so, when the chip goes I, bad on your when yeah. the chip breaks on your bulldozer, and the replacement part yeah. is, you know, nine months away, and now you can't yeah. push the regolith on top of your colony to be able to stop people from exactly. getting the radiation, right? And you got to yeah, wait nine you're gonna have months. to be really good at improvising, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. yeah. yeah. Um, one thing I find interesting, and I'm not actually sure where I stand on this, but in terms of just the psychological elements of it, uh, people sometimes use this to say that that is very difficult, right? Or just having people living in a, an environment like that for long periods of time, an enclosed environment, an environment that um, has a lot of stress. I don't know about that. Humans in, throughout history have done things that have been far worse, I think. Mm -hmm. And you think about, for example, and going back to military history, being like in a submarine in World War II or something like that, where you're, if you're a crew, you're never allowed to go above deck. You're in confined space yep. for like six month patrol, maybe. The food is actually the food tended to be pretty good because the, that was like the one thing they had. <laughs> yeah, just kind of like space. Actually, you probably yeah. would have decent food, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, it's hot and uncomfortable and you're sweaty and you can't take a shower or bath. And it's like, uh, it, so add all like kind of the regular discomforts, it's smelly and uh, loud and machinery is around you and stuff like that. Add all those kind of major, and then you're being attacked by the enemy. Yes. So, you know, you're in constant uh, peril and you're fearing f that any day could be your tickets up. And, you know, so humans have done things and that was, really common like i mean mm -hmm. thousands of people went through that experience during world war ii yeah. so compare that to going to mars and going to mars seems kind of like a uh, vacation <laughs> yeah yeah right? like, and again I, you're, I, you're exploring you're doing this together yeah. no one's shooting at you um yeah yeah i mean it's like like shackleton's journey to mm -hmm. antarctica and how he was able to keep the crew together and keep everybody alive and get them all back home mm -hmm. um and yet clearly there were times where i'm sure they were all certain they were goners mm -hmm. and had to get along and had to fight off the you know the the space so, madness yeah. right that, i mean that was the norm uh, yeah you know as i say that was like one of the closing the closing paragraph i think in in the book is throughout history for thousands of years if you went out on a voyage you were facing dangers of storms and pirates and shipwreck and uh, horrible food and scurvy. And you, most people died from malnutrition. Yeah. I mean, you look at the things we've done throughout history. Magellan set out with six ships and I think 270 crew or something like that. It's considered the greatest exploratory achievement of all time, potentially. Uh, sailed around the world. And 22, I think, no, it was 18, I think. 18, I think. People... <laughs> Yeah. managed to make it all the way around yeah and he well, didn't not he and not including with john he was killed in yeah the Philippines. <laughs> yeah 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 and so you just kind of imagine that and they know they knew those were the odds and so so i i i, totally... I he didn't actually know that he, he well, was, so the reason why he sailed was because like columbus he was uh supremely ignorant of geography but <laughs> but they knew that it was they dangerous didn't know that the odds were that bad but <laughs> right. they knew that it was dangerous yeah yeah, yeah, and and so I think that, like, all the people who have signed up for going to Mars, um, I believe them. Like, I know they're this is a thing they want to do, and I believe that this is a, that they will be enriched by the challenge of of doing this adventure. I, it's I don't want to do it. Completely <laughs> in line with things humans have done historically. Yeah. I mean the, I mean the safety consciousness of humans today is just like so so i think about like modern medicine for example modern medicine is the greatest uh 
possibly the greatest technology humans have invented. It's certainly saved the most people of any kind of technology we've ever had, apart possibly from agriculture, like and, and you know agricultural improvements that ended famines. Um, but you know more people are saved by medicine than were killed by all the wars in human history. Yeah. Uh, so modern medicine is a wonderful thing. We've had it for uh, maybe 150 years, depending on where you draw the exact line. Now, to insist on having access to the best possible modern medicine available, if you're doing something that is like going to Mars, is to make modern medicine a detriment, right? So I always think about, in terms of risk, if you're doing something for the first time, something that's difficult and dangerous, we shouldn't necessarily insist on having access to, you know, the best Earth has to offer in terms of technology, right? Um, sometimes you have to improvise and do things on the leading edge of do things that are difficult. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, basically, we have to be careful not to make our technology, which is a wonderful thing, a detriment to us by insisting on having it at all turns. Right. And I, I mean, I think that, I mean, what happened with, say, the Challenger and the Columbia, we learned the hard way how dangerous and what the costs can be, I think, to NASA's credit, and even to, to the US's credit, they they kept going, right? Even though mm -hmm. they, they at no point did the astronauts waver yes. from, from wanting to continue taking this yeah. journey. The although obviously a lot of people were very concerned about the safety of the of the vehicle, and they were eventually yeah. retired, people still uh, flew missions, they learned from the mistakes, and they made mm -hmm. the whole process mm -hmm. better and hopefully safer both times, and 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 kept going. And, and I think that's that shows that 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 willingness to risk it all is still there for the modern explorers, just as much as it was for the people of, you know, the days of yore. Yeah, probably the greatest examples might be the Apollo fire. Yeah, uh, where they kept going. And uh, Apollo, the decision to launch Apollo eight was probably the boldest decision that NASA's ever made in, in the human spaceflight program, because this is the first time they've sent humans outside of Earth orbit. And they did it on only the second flight of an Apollo mission. Yeah, that is bold to send them around yeah. the moon uh, on Christmas Eve, 1968. That was super bold. They reversed the orders of the flights. It was originally supposed to be a test mission with the lander, but the lander was delayed. So they ended up sw swapping the order of nine and eight so that eight launched uh, on this translunar injection that took people far from Earth for the first time on the second flight. Right. Yeah. And I mean, we might see that again, right? The first flight of, uh, I think the first flight of the SLS is uncrewed. Or oh, no, it's, it's going to have people on it. Oh, I forget which, how, how this is going to operate. But anyway, they're going to go to humans very quickly mm. with, mm -hmm. um, I feel like this one is, is uncrewed. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. And uh, if you have some questions uh, for Andrew, uh, I'm, I, uh, I just told people if they have some questions. Uh, actually, uh, Mike McHugh asks, uh, what did you study? Studied aerospace engineering. I did kind of do a minor in history at some point. So in, yeah. in, in undergrad, yeah, um, was in geography and a bunch where of did you, aerospace engineering structures. Where did you do aerospace engineering at? I did undergrad at Carleton University yep. in Ottawa. Yep. yep. And then I did a PhD at MIT. That's cool. I That was actually a long duration human space flight. That's funny. I so I I went to UBC for engineering and that was my plan was to go into mechanical engineering and then go into aerospace engineering and then I switched into computer science. So um and then ended up doing this, you know, doing this from a journalism standpoint. So uh so that's like and I I could just tell that I just didn't have the right mind for being an engineer. I I you know but you could have easily been a historian. It sounds like you could have gone. gone I think way so. Yeah, I kind of debated that. Um, I kind of like everything, actually. Uh, <laughs> I know the feeling. So yeah. I had I I struggled uh, trying to decide what I was going to do. I was really interested in biology and science and marine biologist. I wanted to be at first, and uh, but I guess I figured engineering uh, to me was also definitely on the list, particularly aerospace engineering, which I sort of got into from. Um, 
historical standpoint, I really liked airplanes, the history of aviation, and I really and I got a pilot's license when I was seventeen, and I wanted, really wanted to just build my own airplane. That's oh, wow! Kind of why I did it? Oh, that's it cool. It was almost more for aviation, um, but then I had a friend who was really interested in Mars and he kept talking about why Mars is where, you know, where we should go. And he's really into space. And at the time I was not that interested in space and he sort of rubbed off on me. And I kind of, I read Robert Zubrin's book yep. shortly thereafter, the case for Mars. Yep. And that was just an awakening for me. And, yeah. and that's ever funny. Since then, yeah. 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 Every time I, t I talk to Bob Zubrin, uh, you know, I, you know, I expressed him just how much that book set mm. the course of my entire career. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. I know it did for Elon Musk and it did for Jeff Bezos. I mean, there's a ton of people walking around who that one book kind yeah. of blew, blew everybody's collective minds and even sent ripples through the way NASA thinks about exploring Mars entirely. Yeah, because that to me, it was this kind of revelation that this is possible and we can do something super exciting with the technology we have. And to me, I, I always really liked Star Trek, but real space seemed like pretty limiting because unless we can hop from star to star and have adventures with aliens, like what's the point of going to space? But that book really made me realize that progress is really incremental. And by going to Mars, we establish the conditions that create the incentives to improve our technology to get eventually to other stars. And then there's this middle part of science fiction, which has historically not been told very well which is the expansion into our solar system. And the Expanse does a very good job of this, but historically there was really not any examples of this, except for like Arthur C. Clarke did a really good job in his books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and it, I mean, I think that it, on the one hand, Star Trek and Star Wars and all those, those get us excited about these ideas of, mm -hmm. of space flight and, and traveling and exploring and all that. But then the reality, the harsh reality of just how difficult it really truly is mm -hmm. to make these journeys sort of, uh, I think I watch people time after time, you know, fans of the, of the show, people who, who watch some of the stuff I do, they have this sort of cognitive mm -hmm. dissonance where, where mm -hmm. they're like, why isn't it as easy as Star Trek has led me to believe? Mm -hmm. And there's this time where they spend yeah. just like being super frustrated that it's going to be complicated and difficult and, and it's going to take a lot longer than we all hope. And yet we can watch, SpaceX land rockets on their, you know, on their landing pads again, that, that, that is, that's an incredible technological achievement moving forward and is the next yep. step to the age of fully reusable rockets, which is a total mm -hmm. game changer. It's total. Yeah, absolutely. Total game changer for reasons that people don't even realize. It's not just the fact that rockets themselves are expensive and therefore should be reusable. It's even the payloads, because if you have a, very expensive rocket, then the incentive is not really there to bring down the price of the, the payload, whatever you're launching on it, right? Um, and you need to make absolutely certain it works or reliability becomes number one. And if reliability is number one, then it's going to drive all these costs. Yes. Makes it much more expensive. So it's this uh, vicious circle where if you have an expensive rocket, then it makes the payload really expensive and you have to make sure it works and you have to do all this double checking and then triple checking. And it, it just, it's an enormous cost spiral. So you know, tweaking that equation to uh, reduce the cost of launch is the number one thing we can do as humans to open up access to space. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know uh, we scheduled for an hour. I want to save your I want to save your time here. Um, but uh, again, uh, your book. Do you have a copy handy? You got one too. I do. Oh. Behind me. Yep. Oh yeah. You got you. Man, you always got to have one. In... You can reach. There we go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Keep it uh, keep it handy right beside your computer. Um, the book is Beyond the Known. Uh, Andrew is uh, very prolific on Twitter. You can definitely follow uh, the work you're doing there. Mars Raider. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today, and and good luck. Have you? Is there going to be another one? You're you've done two now, right? Two books. Well, I have. I do have two adult books, and I have four children's books actually. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm playing with some ideas for sure. I, I, something about the evolution of technology. I've got some ideas in that realm. So, yeah. That sounds great. Well, uh, Andrew, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Again, congratulations on writing like more than one book. Usually like one book, people either 
they keep writing them or they'll never write another book. So, so congratulations on getting over that, Thank that you. hurdle. Yeah, I look forward to, to many more and, and good luck with everything you guys are doing at SpaceX. I can't wait. Uh, can, can we get an insider uh, to tell us when nope. Starship's going to fly? No. See, see people not. are going to be asking. Like, I didn't even bother asking him. I know the answer, so I didn't even bother. Um, but uh, as soon as it does fly, uh, let us know. Yep. Awesome, man. All right. Thanks. Take care. Cheers.